never talked about the American American industrialists prior to World War II. Why? Because they wanted a friggin' war. That's why. <laughs> That's not popular. It's very, and they got it. Listen, it's very simple. It. Actually, and Smedley Butler addresses this. He very <laughs> clearly says it in his book. Okay, he says basically up to the War of 1898. America didn't have foreign holdings. Yeah. You mean bases and stuff? Yeah, or any of that. Now we have, yeah. how many, 200 bases around the world, millions of guys spread out? We're all over the place. Yeah. This guy, 80 years ago, was saying, nobody, his words almost exactly, if I remember correctly, said, nobody has heeded our founding father and our first president. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, one of the problems... Not specifically on this issue, just in general, that, uh, that um, uh, let's put it this way, money trumps um, peace sometimes. <laughs> in other words, commercial interests are very powerful interests throughout the world. We don't need any investigation to know who is responsible for Boris's murder. Vladimir Putin. Well, McCain right now is a fool and is being a dangerous fool. And this is that there is a small group of people in the Congress who are pushing this narrative that President Putin was behind the assassination of Boris Nemtsov. There's absolutely no justification for it. There's no truth to it. There's no evidence to it. This is part of a much larger policy, which is also being supported by the administration of President Obama led by Victoria Nuland to carry out essentially a regime change or colored revolution to change the administration of President Putin. The only way the United States can have any effect in this region and turn the tide is to start killing Russians, killing Russians by uh, killing so many Russians that even Putin's media can't hide the fact that Russians are returning to the motherland in body bags. This, this individual is insane. He's sick. This is not the view of the majority of people in the United States. There is an element in the United States and the West and Great Britain that believes they can either back down President Putin or defeat President Putin in Russia and China in a limited nuclear war. And there is a push to get some kind of lethal aid, so-called defensive aid, delivered to Ukraine. But a lot of people realize if we deliver weapons to the Ukraine government, which is working with the Svoboda party and the right-wing sector party who are fascists, Nazis, and we supply weapons to these people, this could be a tripwire to war. The Ukrainians aren't asking for American boots on the ground. That's not the question here. They're asking for weapons to defend themselves, and they are being slaughtered, and their army is, military is being shattered. This is a shameful chapter. I'm ashamed of my country, I'm ashamed of my president, and I'm ashamed of myself. And to start with, we should give them weapons with which to defend themselves. There are Russian tanks in eastern Ukraine, Bob, that they have no weapon to fight against. The, the tragedies that are taking place in, uh, in Syria and in other parts of the world are also taking place in Ukraine. It's the first time that we have shown pictures that document, number one, that this is equipment that has come here, uh, from, from Russia. Well, it's not something that might be happening. It is something that is happening. And as you see the horrible things that are going on over there, you can see that the reason that is really necessary. One of the U.S. Marine Corps' most highly decorated generals, Smedley Darlington Butler, by his own account, helped pacify Mexico for American oil companies, Haiti and Cuba for National City Bank, Nicaragua for the Brown Brothers Brokerage, the Dominican Republic for sugar interests, Honduras for U.S. food companies, and China for Standard Oil. As of food and fuel were choked off. Water for hundreds of thousands of people was shut off. Cities and towns were shelled, mosques were destroyed, and apartment buildings reduced to rubble. Humanitarian baloney has nothing to do with it. It has to do with oil. It has to do with power and greed. And it has to do with psychopaths as presidents. Other civilians. Oops, we killed them. So are you really good at killing people? Maybe you think, yeah, I am. I kill these people all the time. I don't give a damn if they're civilians or not. But I'm good at killing. 
Well, that is not a pretty thing to brag about. So we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> it was not in our national interest to let this happen. Since when was it? What's not our national interest to be there? Where are the prostitutes? Who you have been with? How come you're not talking about this? How come no one's bringing it up now? It's not our national interest. Never was. 30,000 dead. A country destroyed. Why talk about it? Why get upset? It's only another day of murder and murder, Inc. Oh, yeah, invading the sovereign nation. That's keeping this country safe. It works all the time. You invade other countries. You destabilize them. The place is turned into chaos. And there are people that want to get even with you. It's commander-in-chief. And people get away with this stuff. General Butler services were also in demand in the United States itself in the 1930s as President Franklin Delano Roosevelt sought to relieve the misery of the Depression through public enterprise and tougher regulations on corporate exploitation and misdeeds. Large parts of the corporate elite despised what Roosevelt's New Deal stood for. And so, in 1934, a group of conspirators sought to involve General Butler in a treasonous plan. Canada's outline to me was to form an organization of veterans, to use as a bluff or as a club at least, to intimidate the government. But the corporate cabal had picked the wrong man. Butler was fed up with being what he called a gangster for capitalism. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men, which would be able to take over the functions of government. A congressional committee ultimately found evidence of a plot to overthrow Roosevelt. According to Butler, the conspiracy included representatives of some of America's top corporations, including J.P. Morgan, DuPont, and Goodyear Tire. The drastic bombing of London by Nazi Germany, for example, was made possible by a $20 million sale of fuel to IG Farben by the Rockefellers of Standard Oil Company. This is just one small point on the topic of how American businesses funded both sides of World War II. One other treasonous organization worth mentioning is the Union Banking Corporation of New York City. Not only did they finance numerous aspects of Hitler's rise to power, along with actual materials during the war, it was also a Nazi money laundering bank, which was eventually exposed for having millions of dollars of Nazi money in its vaults. The Union Banking Corporation of New York was eventually seized for violations of the Trading with the Enemy Act. Guess who the director and vice president of the Union Bank was? Prescott Bush, the father and grandfather of former U.S. President George W. Bush, and George H.W. Bush. Very few Americans knew what Kuwait was when the invasion took place, and the odds are they didn't care much that Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Uh, they probably couldn't even find it on a map, for the most part. Americans are famously ignorant of geography. So this war very much had to be sold to the American people in order to convince them to intervene militarily. The final witness is also using an assumed name, and again, we ask uh, our friends in the media to respect the need to, for her to protect her family. And we finally call on Naira to testify. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Naira, and I just came out of Kuwait. My mother and I were in Kuwait on August 2nd for a peaceful summer holiday. My older sister had a baby on July 29th, and we wanted to spend some time in Kuwait with her. I only pray that none of my 10th grade classmates had a summer vacation like I did. The Iraqis were making fun of President Bush and verbally and physically abusing my family and me on our way out of Kuwait. Telling you that we have never heard in all this time, in all circumstances, a record of inhumanity, and brutality, and sadism as the ones that the witnesses have given us today. I don't know how the people of the civilized countries of this world can fail to do everything within their power to remove this scourge 
from the face of our earth. She seemed to be alone before the Congressional Human Rights Caucus identified only as a Kuwaiti escapee. But we've discovered she wasn't alone at all. And she wasn't just a simple Kuwaiti escapee. In fact, just a few seats away was her father, Kuwait's ambassador to the United States and Canada. Nayira quickly slipped out of the caucus hearing back into the protective folds of her family, the extended royal family of Kuwait, headed by the emir, Jabir al-Sabah. I have to ask why she was not identified as your daughter when she gave that testimony to the uh, House committee, what the was House it? caucus. Well, for security reasons, I don't believe it was uh, uh, just for, to, for her safety. Did uh, the Human Rights Caucus members and the chair people know who she was. Yes, of course they they knew her identity. They knew her identity and they knew exactly what uh, what the girl was telling them was the truth. How many people knew that she was the ambassador's daughter? I didn't. I don't know who, who knew. Uh, I, I did not know she was the ambassador's daughter. When did you find out she was the ambassador's daughter? Uh, not... Uh, uh, this is the first allegation I've had that she was the ambassador's daughter. Does it affect her credibility in your mind? I think uh, it certainly should have been known uh, at the time of the hearing. Uh, it would have had bearing on what uh, she might have said, yes. I think people, members of Congress certainly, and members of the public uh, were entitled to know uh, uh, the source of, of uh, her testimony, therefore who she was. The president repeated the incubator story six times in his verbal war against Saddam. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. Daylight brings only the digging of yet more graves. As bodies... Soon there were reports of mass burials of premature babies in Kuwait, dumped from incubators which were then trucked to Baghdad. The Iraqis tore the respirators from their incubators. We had to bury many of people. And the story didn't just have an impact in the U.S. The United Nations convened a rare public forum. Time to check the aggression of this ruthless dictator whose troops have bayoneted pregnant women and have ripped babies from their incubators in Kuwait. The House easily approved a war resolution. Then it was up to the Senate to authorize the use of United States armed forces pursuant to United In the States debate, Security the incubator Council story came up seven times. Mr. Dole, aye. Mr. Domenici, aye. Mr. In the end, Jackson, the war resolution only passed by five votes. The U.S. decision to wage war against Iraq was supported by an overwhelming civilian consensus. The heart of that consensus was the belief that Saddam Hussein was evil incarnate. It seemed quite clear that there weren't any deaths which had been deliberately the cause of the Iraqis having gone in and stolen equipment. So how did a story that was essentially untrue become an element in a consensus that sent hundreds of thousands of American and allied troops into a regional conflict that might have been settled by other means? Well, the answer to that question lies in a process that's as American as Pepsi Cola. Anybody who thinks advertising is a hit or miss business has been asleep for 40 years. What you're looking at is a device for measuring the impact of an ad on a target audience. The monitor records the sensory impact of the images, and if it sells Pepsi, it'll also sell a precedent and his message. This morning, I'm also grateful to have this. The company that monitored Pepsi ads also monitored the effectiveness of key players in the war of words that led up to the shooting war in the Gulf last year. What's happening is the people Dee Alsop of the Wirtland Group in Washington picks response groups to rate sales pitches. We give them each a little device. It's about the size of their hand in which they can say whether or not they're reacting favorably or unfavorably to what's being said. And we use that to identify the messages that really resonate emotionally uh, with the American people. So, you're going to stop the Russians, right? This stupid little... How much is this thing costing to go across Europe? All this money being wasted. Look at these photos. Look at the stupidity of it all. Who are they kidding? A lot of people, particularly the congressmen and senators. There is no future for Assad in Syria. Barked. State Department spokeswoman Marie Hoff. Add them up, add them up.
Libya, Ukraine, Russia, Syria, and they still get away with politicians. I think Rand Paul is a good politician. I think he's honest and a straight shooter. I think the I'm other not guy so sure here about that. Um, the guy down in Texas, what's his name? Um, who's the other guy? Ron Paul's you, his father. Ron Paul, right? <clears throat> right. He's good. He he tells it exactly how it is. He talks about what you were saying, no foreign entanglements, all this crap that we're involved in. The budget's a friggin' mess. We basically consume more than we produce. We spend, look at, we, it's our whole culture is a mess, Dave. Right? Listen. Everybody listen, should get I up mean, to their ass. It, it, it's. Why do you think we're fighting these wars, right? I mean, why, why do you think 120-pound women, mothers, that are home, drive these big-ass SUVs that, you, that, that take $100 a gas a week, okay? I mean, if we didn't have our interests the way they are and have the military that we have, would you know, thank God in a way to protect us, but on the other hand, basically to kick it out of people around the world for our interests, right? Right? That's why gas is cheap. It's three bucks a gallon. Go to Europe. What's it? Six bucks a liter. What's it in South America? Right? You know, so, you know, we're still a superpower, but, but, you know, China wants a piece of that. Trust me. And if they have their way, they're going to get it. And what are, you what know, are, what, the are we, what are we talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm saying see, China see, wants what, a piece what, of the what, action. They see, want the next now, superpower. You're now, you're now falling in the trap of creating boogeymen. I'm not, no, nothing. I don't want to fight with them. I don't think we should go fight with them and put them in their place. But, 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 but I do know history. China wants to be the next superpower. Unequivocally. Absolutely. What does that mean?